Hello, and welcome to the Core Philosophy Podcast. This is Chris Muntz, and this is episode 157, Civic Renewal Through Ensemble, with myself and Beth. Last week, instead of a typical adult getaway for our anniversary, Beth and I attended the National Conference of the Braver Angels organization. From the mission statement of Braver Angels, Americans on opposite sides of the political spectrum don't only disagree on issues, they increasingly dislike one another. This growing partisan animosity is the crisis of our time and threatens our nation. Braver Angels exists to address this challenge. For many who have followed the show over the last four and a half years, you might notice that this mission is also the mission of the Coralosophy podcast. I believe that we in music education suffer from this same affliction as well as the broader society. In many ways, because of the politically homogenous nature of the education and performing arts communities, we have it worse than society at large. There isn't a lot of ideological diversity in our spaces. We are badly in need of a dose of our own civic renewal. To this end, I am proud to say that Coralosophy Podcast is now a part of the braver network of organizations and media outlets willing to stand up for the value of bringing everyone to the table to find common ground. As listeners to the show, you can find a link in the show notes to join Braver Angels for free as part of that Coralosophy community. I see a very obvious role for music ensembles to play in this project. The metaphors should be obvious. How many of our choirs, bands, and orchestras bring together people with true diversity of worldviews? How intentional are we about creating an environment where all of our singers and players and students are able to bring their whole selves to class or to rehearsal? Ensemble music is one of the biggest sources of opportunity for large numbers of people to gather in person to unite on a common project. This project of music requires that they set aside their political projects to focus on what they can accomplish together. And we learn valuable lessons on democracy, and we learn valuable lessons on civics by putting things aside so that we can work together on music. It's a crucial skill. So in this conversation, you're going to hear Beth and I talk about how these issues affect us in the music world, as well as recapping our experience at the Braver Angels National Convention. And I think you're going to find uh, a quite a bit of interesting nuggets in here uh, of, for, from experiences and lessons that we learned in Gettysburg last week. And of course, a big shout out to former show guest, Micah Hendler, who was the music director at Braver, Braver Angels Convention. He's in charge of the Braver Angels music team, and they did a great job uh, bringing music into our convention as well. Stick around, and we've got lots to tell you. Attention performing arts directors. Are you looking for a platform that understands your unique needs? Look no further than Ludus.com. Built from the ground up for the performing arts by people from the arts, Ludus is the perfect solution for your organization. With Ludus, you can drive revenue with ticket sales, merchandise, and fundraising, all while saving time, money, and resources. And the best part? It's 100% free to your program. Sign up for Ludus today and take your performing arts program to the next level. Coralosophy listeners can go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy for an upgrade for free to their marketing suite. Patreon page is what really, literally, keeps this light on that is shining in front of me to make sure that I can continue to do, do the show forever. So head on over there. There are, of course, various levels that you can join. And at the producer or above level, we have Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, John Warner, Jonah Clixbull, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, Carlos, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jared Hendricks, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. Head to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and join the crowd. Okay, hello. Hello. Uh, we're going to just have a, um, a, a conversation about an experience that we had last week. And uh, so let's start out by kind of setting the stage. It, last week was our anniversary. Mm -hmm. And uh, you started to tell a story uh, in the car on the way back, um, which I had posted on my Patreon because it was a failed attempt to record. Uh, but why don't you tell that story again so that people can understand uh, what it was from your perspective that we did last week and uh, kind of w w the emotional roller coaster leading up to it for you. Okay. So it wasn't really a roller coaster. It was just that I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So um, you had been mentioning that you wanted to go to a convention 
um, in Getty in Gettysburg, and you had suggested that I might want to come along. And since it was our anniversary weekend, I was like, okay, sure, I'll come along. Um, it's a trip. And I had no idea what to expect. I didn't do any research before we went. I just decided to come along. And um, very quickly after I, I got to the convention and started hearing different conversations and speeches, I was really glad that I had gone and it really appealed to me. And I actually think it would appeal to most people that we know. Yeah. Yeah. And it was oddly, you know, of course, a lot of people would think that it's your anniversary trip. You should go to things like, you know, a beach somewhere or Las Vegas or whatever. But it was an oddly romantic week for us. <laughs> it was fun. I mean, we got to talk about politics a lot mm -hmm. and we were staying in the dorms on Gettysburg College and we ate dorm food and, Sounding really romantic. Yeah. Right? But it led to a lot of really fun conversations. And mm -hmm. Gettysburg is just a really beautiful um, historic town. And we got to tour the, the Gettysburg battle, battlefield. And um, it, was, it was really fun, actually, because it led to a lot of really good conversation. And we got to make some really good connections with other people. And I, I actually really enjoyed it. It was fun. It was an atypical anniversary weekend for sure uh -huh. or week but it was really fun well yeah and, and you say leading to you kept saying leading to great conversations and i think the point of this episode is going to be to highlight uh the, how rare some of those types of conversations are the, the breath of fresh air comment kept popping up for lots of people last mm -hmm. week because a lot of times we're at, we're now in a political environment where if you don't already know the perspective of the person you're about to talk to about a topic, mm -hmm. you probably don't have the conversation anyway. Right. Uh, the, the convers if we're not sure we're going to agree, we probably don't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about kind of the big hot button topics to discuss like abortion or gun control uh, or racism or any of those things, there, there are fewer and fewer opportunities to sit down and speak with a person who doesn't agree with you mm -hmm. um, about those things. So first, and, maybe you better explain what Braver Angels is. Or, or, that's a great segue. I have notes, though. So, okay. So I'll get there. <laughs> okay. I'll um, let you be in charge since it's your show. <laughs> yes, we'll do that. So I think the, 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 the overall um, breath of fresh air quality uh, from last week came from, from that. It was mm -hmm. like you felt like uh, you, it was a safe space to voice all of your thoughts and feelings and, and what you discover by having those conversations with people who don't agree with you is that you discover that there's more common ground than you probably would have imagined. Mm -hmm. And I can't count on both hands how many times that came up last week for a mm -hmm. lot of people. Um, so to your question, what is Braver Angels? Braver Angels is a nonprofit. They're a 501c3 and they are uh, focused on creating situations uh, intentionally to put people in person in rooms together that don't agree to facilitate these types of healing, common ground, bridge building type, types of work. And from their website here, I have a little quote of uh, kind of their mission, which is, there's a statement from their website that says, Americans on opposite sides of the political spectrum don't only disagree on issues, they increasingly dislike one another. This growing partisan animosity is the crisis of our time and threatens our nation. Braver Angels exist to address this challenge. Mm -hmm. So, of course, for people who listen to this show um, and have for the last four and a half years, they're, they're going to recognize that I'm already kind of been an activist in this space where one of the main purposes of me starting the show four and a half years ago was that I noticed that there were, there were just highly polarized, very contentious conversations about almost everything happening in our online environment among music teachers and mm -hmm. amongst choir directors. It was particularly toxic. Mm -hmm. um, and that continues to, that temperature continues to be hot in the choral world. And one of the things that I've noticed is that we are not immune to these problems. In fact, in many ways, they're worse for us because of how politically one-sided uh, most performing arts communities are, yes. Um, yes. How, how politically homogenous they mm -hmm. are, and it tends to be that polarization gets worse when you feel like everyone else around you agrees with you, and you don't even have to consider other people. One thing I've noticed, too, is observing some of your conversations that you've had online is that people are very quick to want to put you in a political camp, mm -hmm. and when they can't find a camp to put you in, I, I note frustration, 
whereas you're just trying to have a discussion, an open discussion. And so um, I, <laughs> I think that that's really, in a broader sense, that's what happens in our country all the time, is mm -hmm. people are, are constantly trying to put each other in, in, a, in some sort of a camp, and they're looking for for the disagreement rather than they're 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 not trying to find common ground, and I think that um, that's that's one of the missions. I mean, and they were Braver Angels was very the, the speakers at Braver Angels were, uh, were very quick to say that this isn't just to come together and sing kumbaya and hold hands mm, all week. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is. You're going to disagree with people. You're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to um, not align with everything that people say, and that's okay. That's the whole point. But it's through disagreement and discussion that we find a solution and we find common ground. And um, you would think that that would be sort of a, a basic human instinct, but because of the perfect storm that we had during COVID, where we were all sequestered away in our homes, sitting behind our computers, and communicating mostly through social media, that that polarization or that divide became even worse and mm -hmm. then heightened by the pandemic. And so with the way in which we view people that have opposing viewpoints has become this big cavernous hole. And so I feel like this has become so needed. Something like Braver Angels has become so needed because we need to come back together and sit down and have conversations in person with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, it's interesting because I would think, and we're both, of course, choral musicians, but I think that this conversation should be relevant for anyone in education at all, um, anyone who's teaching the next generation of kids, especially, though, uh, ensemble music, mm -hmm. a band, orchestra, choir, mm -hmm. because you would think that these would be the types of bridge-building skills that we would already be really good at within choral music spaces. And I, and I actually think that most... Um, music educators are good at these things mm -hmm. because of course you have to be. So for example, if you run a community choir somewhere in the Midwest, which tends to have a lot of you know cities with blue voters and uh, rural areas with red voters mm -hmm. and, and, and along the edges, they're very purple and there's this, this mix, right? So uh, for those of us in the Midwest, we, we operate in a very different political environment than people maybe from the Northeast or from mm -hmm. California where you can really get into these big, you know, liberal bubbles. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're running a community organization in the Midwest somewhere, you already have to get good at this mm -hmm. because you know that you can't operate a choir with only the Democrats welcome mm -hmm. <laughs> or only Republican choir. Like it just doesn't work. Well, and I would and you say have to that figure it... out a way to build those bridges and, and focus on music right. as your common goal. Right. Well, and um Yes, and, and a choir should be an inclusive place where, where all people are welcome, and differing viewpoints should be welcome. Mm -hmm. Why should music educators be um, better at this than everybody else? I believe that in order to, to sing with other people, you have to know other people, and you have to t discuss hard topics with other people. When you're delving into a text... Um, and the meaning of a text, you sometimes have to have difficult conversations. Um, if you are going to sing an African-American spiritual, that might lead you to having a discussion about um, racial issues and whether or not we should be for performing the song and why. And there are politics in anything. You can find a political connection in everything that you do. And I know a lot of people are afraid to talk about these things with their students or with colleagues. And, um, and I, I understand why they're afraid that they, they might offend somebody. They're afraid that they might step on someone's feet or say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It's not coming from a place of, of hate. It's coming from a place of fear. Right. And so I think that, um, if people come to a place like braver angels where they can sit down and have a, an open discussion with people and based on the format that they have and some of the the moderating um, of the, the debates that they have Very in place. Very intentionally moderated conversations yes. so that they don't become yell fests or arguments. Right. Um, people are scared of the word debate. 
Mm -hmm. because a lot of times people think of debate as contentious, angry, back and forth yelling like mm -hmm. cable news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at Braver Angels, there were lots of debates and there wasn't a single raised voice ever, mm -mm. you know, because of the way they moderate. That's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. And so, um, again, it, it left me feeling so excited and I feel like this is something I really want to get behind. Um, we joked that... Um, it's like we joined a cult. We want other people to join our cult. But it's the antithesis of a cult. It is it, multiple. All viewpoints are welcome. And everybody is worth listening to. That was said over and over again. And there were several quotes, you know, given, you know, by uh, Martin Luther King Jr. about everybody, every single person, I'm paraphrasing, every single person on this earth is is worth listening to just because just because they're they are made in human. the image of God, yes. which was Martin Luther King's yes. position. Yeah, that was a really interesting. Actually, that was a, a really interesting moment in the convention where um, uh, where we got to meet somebody who uh, was very was a young boy in the room as Martin Luther King was uh, practicing his his I Have a Dream speech the night before, mm -hmm. uh, just to have that historical perspective. Uh, was, His father was a, worked for Martin Luther yes, King. Yes, a man who's uh, older, a very old man now, who yes. was a, a boy at the time. Um, and so, yeah, and I, I think the, the reason that, that this is important for my audience to think about, and that's why I, I brought us back to the, the music classroom, is, you know, you mentioned uh, that when we sing together, we might have to uh, to encounter uncomfortable conversations and mm -hmm. uncomfortable topics. And you also mentioned that anything can be political or politicized, almost yes. anything. Yes. And I think, so I wanted to drill in on that because one of the things that's important about for choir directors in particular, so if you're in my position, you, you never know. If you, let's say you've got a group of 60 people there, and you, you, I'm assuming that you're not some type of a political activist choir where mm -hmm. you've already, you, like, you know, you've attracted everybody who already agrees with you. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about your school choirs, your general community choirs, probably church choirs in a lot of places where you've got people who have different political views across the entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we speak so much in music education about being inclusive, mm -hmm. but we almost never mean that. <laughs> we almost never mean being inclusive of people with wide ranges. Of political views, what we mean is the type of inclusion that you can see, uh, skin color, sexuality, mm -hmm. um, those types of things. But we ne almost never ex expand it, extend that to politics or to um, to just viewpoint. You're right. And, and and what's you also never know as a, as a member of a choir or the director of a choir. Um, to back to your point, which is you can politicize everything if you want to, but you also never know who next to you will think of certain things politically that you know, that you don't. So, for right. example, uh, not everyone thinks about every topic in a political way. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, it, but then they might uh, trigger the person next to them because of some comment they made and that was totally innocuous, mm -hmm. uh, right? So these types of conversations come up in choirs. And if the director, in my opinion, doesn't set up an environment where... Um, we're, a lot of these kind of moderation skills that we saw at Braver, Braver Angels are part of the culture of the ensemble, mm -hmm. then people don't feel safe to have those text conversations and those poetry analysis, analysis conversations, or even just having open and free conversations during break time mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. If your school or church are in the market for staging products like risers, shells, podiums, movable platforms, all of the things that you need to set your choir up for success, I would like to strongly urge you to check out StageRite. StageRite's products are sturdy, they're durable, they're easy to use. I have personal experience with the acoustical shells and some of the platforms that they have at StageRite, and I can tell you, compared to some of the more expensive competitors, they are a really great option to fit inside of a tight school budget, but also to give you the durability and usability that you need. So check out StageRight at StageRight.com. Yes. Um, one, of, one of the interesting things that, um, well, you you know me. You know that I'll talk to anybody. I'll, ta I'll literally talk to homeless people all the time. <laughs> we'll be walking down the street. I, I will listen and talk to anybody about their political viewpoint. That's, that's not something I've ever struggled with. But um, one of the areas that I really had to do some inside work and really I felt was like, okay, this, this is something I need to work on is um, depolarization. 
And when, when you, you yourself are calling somebody, um, a radical leftist or a, a crazy right winger or whatever people in the extreme polar polar opposite places you are increasing polarization right and just by saying those things whether it be in conversation and i'm not saying that in public but i might just like think it or say it to a friend you mm -hmm. know and i i did that during covid a few times and I'm, I'm just being honest here and those things i know we all do those but that's increasing our divide between mm -hmm. people and I, I'm going to make a conscious effort to not do that as much anymore going mm -hmm. forward. Um, and I'm, I'm going to look for more common ground with people in the future. Yeah. And you will find what you look for. You will. Right. So like, and just like when you, um, when you buy a new car, suddenly you start to notice that car everywhere right. on the road. Right. It's not because everyone bought the same car as you. Mm -hmm. It's because your perception started to become awakened to that car. Right. Right. Um, and so, for example, we were talking about Ford Broncos the other day because we thought those were cool. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I feel like I see them everywhere because I was talking mm -hmm. about it, looking for it. Right. So political fights versus finding common ground, mm -hmm. polarization versus common ground is the same way. If you are looking for the fight, you will find it. Mm -hmm. And that, that, will, that will be the same. You mentioned earlier people who come on to my social media, media posts when I'm trying to start conversations, which is what I do when I mm -hmm. post things. I, I am trying to provoke a conversation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people read them and they think, well, he is trying to provoke my emotions. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I can't control that. I, I, right. I, I, can't, I can start a conversation. You may like or not like the conversation. But if you're coming to those conversations looking for a fight, you will find one. But mm -hmm. if you're coming to those conversations with curiosity of like, oh, why does this person think that? Well, I then, also, you will, then you will start to discover that you, you probably disagree about less than you think. That's just one of the pitfalls of social media too. Mm -hmm. Trying to have yeah. conversations on social media, that's, that's what you'll get. But um, that's, that's one of the things that, um, that felt so good too is after three years of having most of our political conversations online, we were able to then have in-person conversations. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was some of the conversations that we had. Do, do you care if I share one, one of the conversations? Yeah. Oh, that's next on my list. Look at that. <laughs> Following the flow unintentionally. Um, I had a great conversation with a woman who um, a black woman who was who was there um, with a, an organization, but we had a really good conversation at lunch one day. She said that her her church had split after the events that that surrounded well COVID and then George Floyd, and it it was she said it was horrible and she was tearful and she said that her her church that she had attended for 17 years um, split and she and her husband stuck around, but it just, it was really painful. And it was really hard to have conversations with people, um, specifically when most of their interactions they were having were online. They were having online church services and they weren't able to actually talk to people. And she said that she had attended one of the discussions, um, uh, one of the political discussions that they had had and she felt that she had so much more in common with people wearing red lanyards than she had assumed. And she, she, she said that she has, she has hope. She mm -hmm. has so much hope for our country now. And that was another thing that we, um, you, I'm sure that you already knew this. I learned a lot. Um, there were some things that I already knew, but there, I, just to see them spelled out was amazing. Um, we went to a, presentation given by Jonathan Rausch, who was brilliant. That mm -hmm. was amazing. Um, and he had a bunch of different charts and graphs displaying um, data, collected data, showing that our perception of the opposite side of the political spectrum is so much more polarized than it actually is. So our perception... Or put another way, people are typically wrong. Yes. About, about what they think the other side actually thinks. Right, exactly, yeah. the mm -hmm. other side. Mm -hmm. um, but when you, he, he showed this other graph saying that when you actually pull these people and show how they really feel on a lot of hot topic political issues, there is so much more overlap and they feel so much more the same about these issues than they realize, than, 
they even realize. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's the the propaganda and the polarization that happens from the media. Yeah. And people laugh at that. They kind of dismiss that, but they don't realize that, you know, the media is trying to get you to click on something. It's clickbait. They want you to read something and be upset by it and comment on it so that they can get clicks and likes and shares. Mm -hmm. um, well, and one of the reasons that I don't associate with a side per mm -hmm. se is because I know how damaging to my perception that, that it would be for me to attach myself closely and emotionally to a side. So for example, it is all, it is all the time, every day that I'm online, somebody, I will see somebody, and now if it's a music person, it's almost always a Democrat because mm -hmm. just math, mm -hmm. um, is talking about this thing that Republicans want to do to me. Mm -hmm. Be but because I'm not attached to a side, my perception of what Republicans are actually saying is that I always, almost always know that's not actually what they think. Right. Have you asked them? Like, have you asked somebody who's really knowledgeable from the other side about why they support this policy and what, what it is they're trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. You might not agree with them. Right. But don't put words in their mouth. And then it happens on the other end where I'm on maybe, you know, maybe Twitter or something and I see a right-wing wing person talking about what the Democrats are want, want to do to me. Right. And I'm like, but have you talked to any? Right. Like, the, right. This, where, cause either it's either they're trying on purpose to p use bad faith efforts to put words in someone else's mouth mm -hmm. to make them look bad, which I think definitely happens mm -hmm. or they just don't know. Right. But, jo but the research Jonathan Ma Rausch uh, put out uh, in that presentation, all, a lot of it came from hidden tribes, which is a website that I've uh, posted for their content quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, yeah, it's it, by and large, people are wrong. Mm -hmm. about what the other side thinks and it's uh, it's amazing what just a, a few conversations will will do mm -hmm. uh, to to kind of make you think oh okay well I guess we're not as far apart as I thought we mm -hmm. were and that it, it was interesting to me um, finding out some of the people that who, who are members of braver angels and the the wide swath of of coverage there is in in like political alignment mm -hmm. you have, um, someone who founded the New York chapter of Black Lives Matter. You have um, uh, Francis Collins. You have who, who was is Fauci's head of the NIH. Yep, who was Fauci's COVID. boss, and he was just walking around. We saw him mm -hmm. there, and yeah. I was like, that was kind of no bodyguard or anything. No, <laughs> no. And we saw him having a discussion with um, an another member of Braver Angels, uh, um, kind of just a, a normal middle class American conservative guy, conservative yep. guy, and mm -hmm. they had a very civil discussion and. Um, that was, I mean, it's, it's so needed, so needed right now. And then you also have people that are, you know, with maybe a religious organization, um, more conservative, you have every single walk of life. And you also have people that don't fit the political norms. You, you have, we met, um, some, some people who are African American who were, you know, Republican, who, which is not a lot of just, those. A lot there of them, lot which of is pretty black folks atypical. Red lanyards, yeah. And then there mm -hmm. was a um, a trans man who is um, conservative, also, right? And that is pretty rare too. Mm -hmm. And so it was just really interesting to talk to those people and hear how they arrived at their, you know, in their political camp, so to speak. And um, I I just loved every minute of it. Yeah. And I had I never had one boring conversation. It was just all so amazing. Um, and I, I really left feeling a renewed hope for the future of America. I right. really, I really feel that way. Let's jump into some of the very specific types of events that we saw while we were okay. there, because this all will, right. this will kind of help put people, uh, put people who are listening in, in perspective of, okay, so what exactly happened mm -hmm. at this event? Mm -hmm. uh, I will mention too, before we get into that, um, I am very proud that the Coralosophy podcast is, is part of the Braver Network, mm -hmm. which is essentially, I'm not, this is not a paid advertisement, mm -mm. I'm not, right? It's not I, a for-profit uh, organization. It's, it's, yes, yeah. I'm not, uh, they didn't ask me to make this, this episode. Mm -hmm. We're just inspired by this, uh, this movement for civic renewal, which mm -hmm. I mentioned before, um, the, has been my mission here at the show for years before I ever heard of a Bra Braver Angels. So I signed up the Coralosophy podcast as part of the Braver Network, which simply means organizations and media outlets who are all kind of aligning behind this mission. Mm -hmm. So listeners to the podcast can actually join the uh, Braver Angels for a year for free. Uh, so the link is in That's the show notes. Cool. Yep, the link is in the show notes, and you can join as a Coralosophy 
community member and have uh, access to all their content and all of their uh, upcoming events and find out about events in your area. And I can tell you that some of these conversations in person are just so therapeutic. Mm -hmm. uh, so the very first one we went to was called uh, Polarization in Black America. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to move through these kind of quickly just so mm -hmm. we don't uh, go too long here. Uh, but Polarization in Black America was a conversation moderated by John Wood, who's uh, the National Ambassador for Braver Angels. That discussion was amazing. It was me. incredible. It was and amazing. The participants were Ian Rowe, who is not really a political actor himself. He is a little bit like more towards the right, so he's a mm -hmm. little bit more of a conservative person. And then Tavis Smiley uh, is very much on the left, and John moderated this mm -hmm. conversation about in what ways the Black American community. Uh, is also polar, polarized, mm -hmm. and in what ways do we kind of sometimes not not see that there's that there's so much polarization mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. um, so they talked about issues like affirmative action. That was the main topic. It, was, it ended up, yeah, a lot of the questions in because the of course the Supreme Court decision had just happened, and so right. everybody wanted to hear. Uh, what they thought about that. And of course, uh, Ian and Tavis are both black American men. Um, but what I liked about that conversation, I just want to highlight one because it's a very relevant to a lot of the conversations that I've had on the show. Mm -hmm. There was uh, there was so much common ground in that conversation, even though they disagreed on the, the merits of the ruling itself for mm -hmm. about affirmative action. Mm -hmm. There was so much common ground about why um, there needs to be attention focused on uh, the disparities in education for mm -hmm. black youth mm -hmm. and, and outcomes in this country. Uh, and you're sitting here thinking, okay, but how is it that one of these guys supported the Supreme Court decision, thought it was the right thing to do, mm -hmm. the other thought it was a horrible, hip hypocritical, terrible thing to do, yet when they sit down and have a conversation about why they're either supportive or not, you, they start to figure out uh, that actually we both are focused on the same problem we are just very differently focused on where the solutions right are. something it was the this <laughs> it felt to me like the the result of that conversation was something needs to be done but what we were doing wasn't working uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah. Well, yeah. So, for example, but that's how you find a solution is yeah. by discussion. Yeah, I've I've talked on this show a lot about this idea that I call. I think I might have come up with this term, but it called trickle down social justice, mm -hmm. where and I uh, uh, I've been concerned for a while that when we talk about disparities about on all, along any line, we tend to focus at the, like the most elite experiences mm -hmm. and and notice that there's a disparity about who gets to do those like top level things. So in the choir world. Uh, you know, it'd be your all-state choirs or making it into professional choirs or getting scholarships to universities and, you know, top music schools. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the Supreme Court context, it was going to Harvard, you know, which is like hardly any college kids, right? So we're focused at these like high elite opportunities. And uh, I've always been concerned that that leaves out 99% of the rest of the kids mm -hmm. when you're focused on those outcomes and not uh, in the music context and not on, you know, entire school districts based on zip code where the, the music education is so poor, they, mm -hmm. they, they hardly get any knowledge at all. Mm -hmm. And then, so of course they're not going to make it to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Wait, I just mixed thoughts. They're not going to make it to the Allstate Choir. Right. So in that conversation, uh, Ian brought that up to his credit a lot because mm -hmm. Ian's focus was on building schools. Mm -hmm. he, he, he builds charter schools. Uh, he believes so, that you need to intervene before the kids are at the college level. Like yes. it needs to happen way before when they are mm -hmm. young um, and you know, and he he runs several schools in Brooklyn, and, and it's he, proven that you can do that you with can minority do that. kids. Yes, uh -huh. yep. And so that was a really really good conversation. You you end up you end up coming out of that going, there's no bad guys here mm -hmm. in this conversation. No, there's, and I and I, I I really appreciated hearing. Um, I, I I I found myself agreeing with both men and saying, I get that. I totally get that, and um, I see why. Tavis was upset about the the Supreme Court ruling, and I also see why Ian thinks that it was, you know, a necessary thing to to abolish it. And so I I found myself agreeing with both of them at mm -hmm. times. So, yep, yep. So another another one we saw, and actually this one's uh, only I was there, so I'll speak to this one, which was uh, I went to a debate uh, called that where the the resolution was should we abolish DEI? Mm -hmm. And of course, most of my listeners would know diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, is what DEI stands for, and we were they were the specifically talking around should we abolish the trainings 
that happen in schools mm -hmm. and in um, you know various organizations in the workplace, that kind of thing. And uh, there were probably a hundred people in the room, a really solid mix of yellow lanyards and blue lanyards and, and red lanyards. Uh, there were people who stood up. It was a parliamentary style debate, which means that people could, can raise their hand and offer points of clarification and or ask questions and or have their own timed uh, statement. And there were probably 25-ish people that spoke during that 90-minute conversation, uh, kind of in the round. There was no yelling. Uh, there was no, uh, I didn't see anybody visibly get angry. Uh, there were definitely a few people who were kind of like rolling their eyes at some statement they disagreed with or whatever, mm -hmm. but lots of um, snaps in support of comments. Um, and one of the things that I noticed about that conversation is that there were blue lanyards who stood up to speak against DEI trainings. There were red lanyards that stood up to support DEI trainings, mm -hmm. which of course that was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I also noticed that um, that there weren't anybody take there wasn't a single person who spoke who was taking an extreme position. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I I raised my hand to speak a bunch of times, but I never got called on, so I didn't get to give my little speech. But um, I would have stood up, and I could have crafted my argument in support or against because of how I feel about DEI. In other words, I could have stood up and say, um, I don't think we should abolish DEI trainings, but I think we should change them. Right. We should make them better right? because there are some real problems with oftentimes mm -hmm. the way they're presented. Or I could have said, uh, yes, we should abolish DEI programs as they currently exist. Right. <laughs> well, and you, and, as an educator, you know firsthand how they work when, uh -huh. when applied. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem is a lot of people don't, don't see firsthand how, how this is affecting people in, in their everyday classroom. And um, they need, I think they need to spend more time talking to teachers about how they feel about it. Just because I think people immediately assume that if you do get rid of DEI training, that means you're, you know, racist or you're, you're a bad person or something. But when it's, it could be that it's not helpful and that maybe we need to change the system and make it better. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, Again, this is why we need to have conversations with people and talk to people about it. That's And that's something that I've noticed, too, just from having in-person conversations with people on um, both sides of the political spectrum prior to Braver Angels. I've noticed that. It's it's not that um, the that most people that on the, on the right disagree with um, the fact that there needs to be something in place it's that it's that it's um it's broken the system is broken right and i think because there are so few conversations related to things like dei where you can question the quality of a of a program or a mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. and not immediately have your motives questioned mm -hmm. that's the toxic part of the, yes. the thing and this this braver angels conversation was so refreshing because one of the other things if you've ever participated in a parliamentary style debate there's a hundred people in the room, and based on just how the the crowd kind of reacts to certain comments, you can actually pick up on consensuses being built right. in the meeting. So, like all the snaps and like you know pounding on the chair and all that kind of stuff. Visceral and, reaction to yes. things. Yes, and by the end, I could really tell that there was a strong consensus in the room amongst all the political perspectives that were represented that there needs to be some way for us to talk in schools and in workplaces about the need for. Uh, about the value of diversity, about the uh, cultural competence of uh, knowing that people around you might have different backgrounds and different mm -hmm. cultures. And, and there, there's, there is a need to have a conversation uh, within those spaces about how do we make this place more inclusive. Mm -hmm. So if you take the DEI just on its face value, diversity, equity, inclusion, everybody in that room would have said, yes, those are important things. Yeah, yeah. But are we open to having conversations about, well, what about when the program you put in place isn't working? How right. do we measure its success? Um, is it open at, opening itself to criticism amongst the people who are in right. that space? And what, hey, guys, what are we getting wrong as the trainers? Right. We are not the only people who know right. what, what these things are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I think as long as, I think if we would present DEI in that way, mm -hmm. we would depolarize the entire conversation. Absolutely. And so that was, that was refreshing. I agree. Snap, snap, yeah, oh, snap. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, another one that I, uh, this will be really brief, but I also uh, attended a re should we reelect Joe Biden mm -hmm. uh, debate. Same format as the DEI debate. Um, and that was only interesting to me and I to bring up because 
you also started to learn over the course of that time that there was a consensus amongst all of the people there uh, that regardless of how they felt about Biden or Trump, that we, that we need better choices uh, for who should be the president of the United States. Nobody seems seemed to be very excited to support Biden in, the, in that debate, mm-hmm. but they were very, of course, against Trump. So we should vote. We should vote for Biden so that Trump doesn't win again. Mm-hmm. You know all this kind of stuff. But ultimately, you learn nobody's really excited about their candidate. We need we need better choices. We need some new choices. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what were some of the other kind of highlights for you of things that you saw beyond just um, the personal? Um, I could may we discuss the Francis Collins um, yes. discussion? Yes, oh, I forgot to put that on my list. Of so, course, that was big. Yeah. So that was the discussion I was the most excited to attend. Um, I had a very um, interesting experience with with COVID. I think that yes, nobody came out of that uh, out of COVID unscathed. I think that you know. Some more than others, though. You know, I, I know many people who lost loved ones. I know many people who, um, who who experienced things in you know as nurses, as you know, in the workforce, you know, with you know in person working with dying people. But then we also know some people that that really didn't affect them that much. You know, they were able to they they were like, you know, I already worked from home and it didn't really affect me that much. Mm-hmm. With us, I would say it had a very big impact on our lives. Um, we not only had um, our own kids having to study virtually during that time. Um, teaching online. T- you were t- you were teaching online. Um, I I teach thirty private boy students, and I I was having to I taught online for a little while, and then when I was teaching in person, I was seeing the effects that studying virtually was having on my students, and that was particularly painful. And seeing seeing kids really struggle with an anxiety and depression, and then of course that led to there were suicides in the school district and that was affecting our students. And, um, and then I, uh, I lost my mother. Um, she had a, a rapid cancer that, um, she was diagnosed with and passed from within one month. And, um, I wasn't allowed to see her. Well, when she first went into the hospital, my, my daughter, that was the first day when the day she went to the hospital, that was the day my daughter had to do virtual school in the fall of 2020. And so I couldn't go visit my mom because she she was having to struggle with virtual school. And then when um, um, my mom was in hospice, I wasn't allowed to see her because because of the COVID rulings, right? Mm -hmm. So I might have COVID, I might spread it to somebody else, or she might have COVID, might give it to us. Um, And that had a direct impact on our family, Mm -hmm. All, all of the things that happened that were trickling down from um, the government. And so I was interested to see how, how this conversation would go. And it, it became quickly apparent, um, first of all, I, I highly commend Francis Collins for being willing to be open to this conversation. Um, he, he didn't have to do that. And I, I think that him, I think he's realized the, he's realizing the effect that all of this had on the American people. And he's, I think he's, there's a remorsefulness that he's having. And just to make sure, because you're not being super clear, when you say this, you mean the government's policies related to COVID prevention yes. and its unintended consequences. Yes, Cause correct. Because you very well could be talking about it as just the pandemic. Okay. The fact that COVID existed okay, affected not, lots of people. Yes. Right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry for my vagueness. Yeah. Um, yes. So... Um, he did admit, Francis Collins did admit at some point that he was not really thinking about how this would affect the common everyday man. Um, and he didn't know, he didn't know how it was affecting everyone. He, he, he was disengaged from that. He was thinking, we have to save lives. How do we save lives? And he was looking at it one dimensionally. Right. He was looking at it from not wanting to spread. Which was a huge admission. It was a huge admission. Because I had been saying that on my social media for years during the pandemic and being called all kinds of names Yes. because I was critical of, of frankly, Francis Collins and his team of policymakers yes. for, for very clearly not considering how their policies might have downstream effects. Mm-hmm. And in that conversation at Braver Angels, he, he said that. He mm-hmm. said, when he flat out said, we were not considering how our policies might affect the average person in the Midwest somewhere. Mm-hmm. 
um, we were considering, and he said, this is something public health people tend to do, is they get uh, their, their tunnel vision set on, in, the, in this case, reduce COVID spread, reduce COVID spread, reduce COVID spread. And it's hard for them to see that there are other pol- other problems. That Economic effects, mm-hmm. which we're, we're seeing, and then huge issues in, in learning and, and um, development in children yep. and, and behavioral issues in the and classroom. And what, what type of health problems then? come from that down the road. Right. And then, and then people that weren't getting care, like my, my mother ignoring her, her lump that she had for a couple of months because of COVID and then it would being too late Mm -hmm. eventually. So all of these, all of these mandates and, um, governmental, um, decisions had just huge effects on people beyond just COVID. And so, um, I, I have to say that was the one conversation that I felt that, was just a little bit um, disappointing. I feel like that's something I would I would like to see a, a redo of that one. Maybe another conversation involved um, involving Francis Collins in the future. I think um, it was very obvious to me that people in the the room were very eager to talk, and there were there was there were visceral reactions happening from the room. Um, I think there needed to be maybe more of a Holding his feet to the fire. Holding his feet to the yeah. fire. And that's that's something that there's a difference between arguing and name calling versus actual discussion. Right. And I think for people to move forward, they need to to to, to um, be heard. They need to have their their concerns, their issues be heard so that we can prevent something like this happening in the future. So right. that we can avoid something like this in the future. And um, yeah, there was a really good question that was asked of him in that conversation also, which was related to something else that I was a huge pet peeve of mine during the pandemic, which is that, uh, you know, one set of expertise related to a disease is important and Mm -hmm. we should listen to experts, Mm -hmm. but there's other types of expertise that's relevant when you're talking about a national response to that health issue. Mm -hmm. And, and Francis Collins did acknowledge that they didn't do a good job of, Mm -hmm. of communicating uh, this was this, these things. This was really this was the really good part about it, which I thought was really good, is that he he acknowledged that they did not do a good job of communicating their own uncertainty mm-hmm. as policymakers. Yes, they they made it sound and and I he, think he said that that was done on purpose. It was done on purpose because they were worried about combating all of the misinformation and conspiracy theories that were floating around out there. Right, and if the government then steps in and says, "Well, we think we're right," blah 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 blah, they 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 felt like they needed to um, say. Double speak, down. Yeah, to double down and speak with absolute certainty, and and he, I think he knows now that that was a mistake. Because, he, he lost people. He yeah. lost people, and um, he said, I remember he said at some point, um, I don't know what happened. At some point, you know, people people were not wanting to get this vaccine, and people were we we lost trust from a lot of people, and um, he's like, I don't know what happened. He mm-hmm. said, I don't know what happened. And it, I think it was because of the doubling down. That was one of the, the, the first issues because there, there were issues that were coming up, like the, the adverse effects of the va- vaccine, which he acknowledged. He mm-hmm. said, he, he mentioned that. And some people don't even acknowledge that that's an actual thing. There are, no, and, there are no medical products that don't have side effects. Right. And when they acted like this one is just totally safe a and con- effective. And of people course, were, yeah, were saying that, were basically saying, like, you're a conspiracy theorist if you think that there are adverse effects to this. I, I have friends that were just completely ostracized by family members and other mm-hmm. people online for having concerns. Right. Um, and so um, that it, it was so good to hear him talk about these things publicly. And mm-hmm. I, I, I was actually wanting there to be a longer conversation, more of a conversation. It is, it's still, I mean, obviously we're coming down from, from the pandemic, you know, we are, we're healing from it. We're moving forward. We're 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 dealing with our, our emotions from what happened. But I think a way for people to move forward is to have more conversation about it. Yep, yep. And I, and we're gonna uh, speaking of more conversation, we're gonna wrap this conversation up. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, people can uh, learn more about Braver Angels at the links in the show notes. And I encourage mm-hmm. you to use my link to fr- to sign up for free mm-hmm. uh, and join this this project. Because as I said before, um, music educators should be better than the average person. At having conversations about across divides. Right. If that makes you uncomfortable, um, then I, I'm just going to say you're part of the problem. 
I, you know, that, 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 that like we should be able to facilitate these types of things. Uh, so one of the things I would like to do um, in, in future is when there are conventions happening in, 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 a, for, in a coral area, I think we should be having Braver Angel, Angel style debates at coral conventions I, um, that... about coral topics, right? So it, it could even be um, law-based minor versus dough-based minor. Should, should, <laughs> should, all, should all coral, coral classrooms use law-based minor? And then we could have a parliamentary style conversation where people would start to le- would learn a ton about the benefits of both systems. You I know, think and- that's a really good idea. And I, I, my, my thought is that if, if you suggest that, people are going to initially be super opposed to that. But I think that people being opposed to it means they're fearful. They're, it's, it's coming from a place of fear. and um, They're afraid their side will lose. Or they're, 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 they're afraid of controversy. They're afraid mm-hmm. of disagreement. They're afraid of people being offended. But if you go into it with a mindset of, I want to hear what both sides have to say, this could be a learning, a, coming from a place of learning, and, and sorry, touch the mic, coming from a place of learning and a place of openness, if you just open yourself up to that, you can learn all sorts of things. And I think once people experience uh, conversations and even debates with mm-hmm. the, naughty, the naughty D word, um, in this way mm-hmm. that Braver Angels teaches, uh, then I think they would. It would only take one. Mm-hmm. They would experience that, and they would say, "Okay, you know what? This is actually a safe way to have these conversations, and well, it's very therapeutic." And it doesn't just. This shouldn't just appeal to someone if they are a music educator. I think this would appeal to. But that's who my audience. That's is. That's who your audience is. But I'm going to make a shout out to my audience. No, okay. I don't have an audience, but. Just to, to I ha, I'm going to be sharing this episode with friends who are non-music people. I think it would appeal to them as oh, well. Of course. Yeah. yeah, of course. And I, I think that most people would be amazed at how much common ground that they have with other with others. Most people probably know that, but most people, I think, have been um, non-argumentative or not stating their political views online. And so all we hear are the very loudest, most polarized people. And so... We make assumptions mm-hmm. about people, and we don't really know. We don't realize that we we have so much more common ground. Yep. So much more common ground with people, and so yes, I highly recommend Braver Angels to to everyone. Absolutely. Um, okay, and as we go out, of course, everybody who's listening, don't forget to like, share, uh, send this to somebody who you think would be beneficial, or you would you think would benefit from um, getting a chance to participate in some type of a. Uh, civic renewal project. If you mm-hmm. if you know people who are uh, of like mind, then share it. Or if you think that you know people who would be really really pissed off that we had this conversation, <laughs> also also share it with them. Not just like minded um, people. That's the whole point. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's the it's, whole to, point. it's to prove that there, that more common ground can be found. Like, share, go to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy, and subscribe there. Uh, there are lots of behind-the-scenes uh, materials that you can find there. And, of course, don't forget to use Coralosophy at checkout when you go to uh, the Ryan Main's new website, by the way. RyanMain.com is now EndeavorMusicPublishing.com. You can still use Coralosophy to get 10% off. MyMusicFolders.com, SiteReadingFactory.com, GraphitePublishing.com, and Voce Vista, the audio file an analyzer, an overtone analyzer. You can get 10% off at all of those websites with the Coralosophy code. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for having me. <laughs>